man. I think this thing is on. Welcome, everybody. Anybody here completed a marathon in the past? We've got two. Raise that hand bold and proud. This is your moment, right? Like, you know, you're the only one, the three people that are nuts enough to do that, right? All right. So I've got a, uh, just, you know, indulge me for a moment here. So Sean Burke is somewhere around 15.4 miles into it. Uh, and Emily Wernis is almost halfway, almost to the 12 mile mark. So be praying for them. <laughs> the, you know, they say if you have ever done like a long race before or a marathon before, or maybe even if you haven't done it, you, maybe you've heard this, that the last six miles feels like the last half. Okay, because your body is screaming at you, why did you do this to me? And, and then people, okay, one quick little uh, tidbit here. People along the race route in the last few miles, they, they're ignorant, but they want to say something that they think will encourage you. So what do they say? You're almost done. Hang in there. You're, you're getting close. You still have five or six miles left. You're not almost done. And that five or six miles feels like 12 or 13 or 18 or whatever. Those people don't know what they're saying. And when you're running, you want to hit them. Because your body is screaming pain and you want them to feel pain. So if you're ever a spectator at some, some time in the future and you're tempted to say, you're almost done, stop. Think about what you're about to say because it doesn't help anyone. Okay, just wanted to get that. It's kind of a public service announcement for all of us this morning. Look at those beautiful colors. It's kind of washed out a little bit, but Jennifer and I got away this past week. I've always wanted to get up north and see the colors in the fall, and we finally did it. After 25 years of marriage and whatever years of life, finally got up there and saw this beautiful overlook, and the colors were amazing, so that was awesome. Here's something else that's beautiful and amazing. Inside your bulletin, there is an insert. Maybe you don't put that in the same level as fall colors, but that's where I'm going this morning. A couple of things on there. This fall fest is coming up very soon. Yeah, right? All those colors, right? Ah, it must have cost more of those colors. So look at that. The fall fest is coming up. Invite friends. Bring something, chili or soup or otherwise. We'll have a great time at the Bester Farm. So make sure it's on the calendar. The other side... It's a little book club reading option that we have. Uh, Pat's going to lead us as we read. Uh, maybe you're not the kind that likes to read or likes to think about culture and Christianity and the church and how they interact. But if, if that's been you, then stop and start thinking and start reading and start engaging with what's going on here. This book, don't agree with everything he says, but it's provocative and it pushes the limit, uh, pushes my limit in some ways, and, and, and if you don't agree with him, at least figure out why you don't, and then what do you agree with? Because these are, he presents information that the church has to grapple with. We've got to start thinking about, oh, where is it that we're going in a culture, in a time, uh, and even legally, uh, that things begin to look a, a little more and, well, more and more um, hostile to a, a, a Christian church that is Bible-believing and believes that God's word is the authority, the ultimate authority, so forth. So uh, it, this book does an excellent job as the, maybe the, uh, the open door, the entry point to getting into that discussion. Three times we'll get together, talk about what's in that book. It, it, it just ought to be a ton of fun. So uh, get, get that on your calendar somewhere. We are currently, if you're new this morning, we're currently going through the book of Mark. So there we go, and we are in Mark chapter 8, and until now, until this point, this whole book of Mark that we've been going through uh, has been fast-paced. Mark keeps saying immediately this and that happens, and we get to the end of chapter 8, and wham, Mark slams the brakes on. He stops saying immediately all the time, and we are forced to slow down to a walking pace. Because we are joining in, we get to eavesdrop on the conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples as they are walking. So it's no longer run over here, immediately go over there, slow down. He wants us to stop and to hear and to think 
and to consider what is going on. So last week we started looking at the, the conversation that's on the path that Mark brings us into, allows us to hear. Jesus asks the disciples as they're walking, who do people say I am? Well, you know, somebody important. And then Jesus focuses the question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter uh, jumps right out there, as he typically does, and says, well, that you're the Messiah, or you're the Christ, or, or in other words, you're the anointed one. You're the one that's sent to be the deliverer, uh, uh, anointed by God for the people. So he kind of you know, throws it down there for the disciples and for us to begin to consider now, if you haven't already yet, we've been introduced to Jesus, we have seen what he can do, We're, we know somewhat of his power and his authority, and we've heard him uh, teaching about his kingdom that he talks about, that we need to repent and believe and join in on, and, and all this rapid fire, and now he is about to speak very plainly to us. So what does he say? Well, he keeps using the seeing metaphor, all right? Uh, everything uh, it, it he's, it he's building on has to do with sight and seeing. So uh, we're continuing with that kind of metaphor, that kind of thinking this morning. To the disciples, uh, uh, in a very irritated way, he asked them, Don't, do you have eyes and not see? Right? We looked at that at the beginning of chapter 8. Uh, to the blind man that he heals, that he heals in stages. We talked about that last week. Uh, are, are you now starting to see anything? Not just... Uh, uh, an interesting question, an important question for this man who was blind, but an important question for us. Are we starting, the disciples as well, are we starting to see? Uh, and in the stages that, you know, that our sight is finally uh, coming to us, we're finally being able uh, uh, to be uh, uh, close enough to Jesus to understand enough about him uh, that our vision is becoming clearer. And hopefully, so clear that we can now respond to who Jesus is. Uh, we just talked about who do you say I am. And now Jesus, in this part of the chapter, he is going to make things plain. And that's what Mark tells us. So when you see, or at least begin to see plainly or clearly, you can begin to understand the place of these three things. Now this part of the chapter is huge. It's like the hinge. It's the... It's the, the key, it's the, it's the turning point of what's going on in this book. Uh, I can't overstate that. I really can't. Everything has been leading up to now. So if there's ever been a point in this book where Jesus is speaking truly, I say to you, where he's looking at you in the eye, where he's saying, I need to make sure I have your attention because it all boils down to this, this is the point. And not just this point, but where, we, where we're at now, the end of chapter 8, all through the rest of the book and through the passion of that final week of Jesus' life, he has led us to this point. So keep in mind, Mark is really written for us, okay? Uh, the way that Mark writes, the way that he explains things, his original audience would have been non-Jewish people, would have been Gentiles, would have been Roman people, would have been a mix of backgrounds, and he was writing soon after the time of Christ, in a way to get the truth, to get the gospel out, the word of Jesus, to people who are clueless and don't have any background info. So he is writing to people like us. So I can't emphasize that strongly enough. What he's saying now has profound implications for our individual lives and especially also for the life of the church, the fellowship. What do we do with his words? So, uh, he, there's so much we could do. I'm going to do my best to try to develop in a timely way this morning what we're, what we're going for. But what he pushes us to have to confront, okay, to have to face what it means for Jesus and for his uh, disciples and for us to suffer. Uh, what does it really mean to follow him as he speaks to us plainly? And even glorifying Christ in the midst of it and through all of that, what does that mean for us today? So with that in mind, before I read the passage, let's pause again and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us to this point in your, your holy and your perfect and your wonderful word. We ask again, Lord, that you 
would use your, your living and active and powerful word to speak into us, to cut through the haze, the distractions, the distortions, Lord, uh, where we just haven't got it or we haven't been seeing clearly. Lord, give us eyes of faith that we'll see clearly. Uh, and Lord, bring us into a, a, a situation or even a, a, a posture, Lord, where we can sit and listen at your feet and understand for us personally and for our church, what is it that you would call us to do? Lord, give us that kind of focus this morning that we can hear from your spirit and be willing to follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so here's the passage. Let's read it. Mark 8, beginning of verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So much ground to cover. So here we go. The beginning point, that first point, where is he pushing us to understand and see plainly? First of all, suffering. Jesus said the Son of Man must suffer many things. Jesus would not fit or preach or be accepted well as a preacher in Minnesota or possibly anywhere in the Midwest. He is not a passive-aggressive guy. You cannot say that about these words. Mark says he speaks plainly. He's not beating around the bush at all. He's speaking directly and plainly, and especially as you read that confrontation with Peter, not a whole lot of passive-aggressiveness anywhere in there when he calls Peter Satan, okay? That's, that's not a little deal. That is a very big deal. Can you imagine being Peter or even any of the disciples? Whoa, whoa Lord, that's, uh, that's a bit much. Let's kind of sit around and talk about this for a while and kind of tone it down. Get behind me, Satan, right? What did he say? What is going on there to elicit such a response from Jesus? So there's nothing passive-aggressive about what's going on in this teaching here. We've got to meet them at what's going on. So, Jesus begins to teach them, and he says, the Son of Man must suffer many things. So we've got to break apart and unpack a little bit what's going on. Why is this a must? Now think about it, especially in our culture today. What he goes on to describe in chapter 8 is a situation that is terrible taking up your cross. Well, even before that, in verse 31, uh, he must suffer, be rejected, uh, and be killed. Uh, He's speaking about things that are foreign to the understanding of the disciples. This should not, this cannot be happening, which is why Peter responds the way that he does. But Jesus says, these aren't an option. The Son of Man must go through all of that. He must suffer and he must die a terrible, bloody, painful, humiliating kind of death. It's it's not an if, it's not, you know, if this happens. Jesus is describing for them now plainly what the Father's plan has been all along. All along for his son and what his son has to go through. So, 
Where is that coming from? Especially if you're new, newer to the faith, uh, new to the Bible, uh, when you talk about uh, death, bloody death, terrible death, the immediate question is, why? This sounds so ancient. It sounds almost pagan. Uh, all this bloodletting stuff going on. Why is the Bible filled with that? We don't think and act like that today. Is God a bloodthirsty monster? Questions like that come up, and those are legitimate questions. So let me give you a little bit perspe uh, of perspective here, okay? What's going on with the original Testament, first of all, all the way through what Jesus is talking about. So back to Genesis, chapter 9, verse 6. The first murder has happened. Sin is in the world, okay? Uh, the, the, the wickedness of that kind of selfishness and what drives people to is now obvious. Genesis 9, 6. God is speaking. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Life and blood are connected. And that is a big deal. When God sees what's happening, it grieves him. And to the point where he makes it clear the consequences are real. And because of sin... There's no longer anything pretty about those consequences. They are unpredictable. Death and murder and all of that, come, that comes with it, the twistedness of that situation, it will bring about death for everyone. That is now the culture, the world, not just the culture, the world that we live in, that we all live in. Fast forward to Leviticus. That's a book that you spend uh, time in regularly, right, with your devotions. Everybody does that, right? Uh, all of these Levitical laws and, and stipulations, regulations, if you will, about worship and about sacrifice. So uh, God lays out for the people there are rules to follow when it comes to sacrificing. And then that sacrificial system that belongs in the temple, that is everything to do with the religious rite with the Jews, there is a reason for that. I said life and blood are connected. When the blood is gone, life is gone. And that's always a big deal, even with animals. That is always a big deal with God. So that is involved in the sacrificial system, death and sacrifice and, and altars. That's not just, you know, old time, backward thinking, whatever people. God lays out that, all that out for a reason. Sin is that bad. Sin, as we've already seen, seen brings about death. And the only way, here's the Bible word, atonement, the only way that that sin can be atoned for or covered up for a time in the view of a holy and perfect God, the only way it can be dealt with for a time is the death of an innocent other. It's the only way. Now, it, right there, a lot of people hit a roadblock. Why can't, God's all, you know, wonderful and perfect and holy, right, and powerful. Why can't he come up with another way? Uh, even Jesus asked a very similar question in the Garden of Gethsemane. If there would be any other way, Lord, that this cup can pass from me, if, if, do it. If there's, even Jesus asked a question. If there's any way to take care of sin that your plan can still remain perfect, that you can do away with it, great, let me add it. And we would all say that. God's response is there is no other way. When innocent life is taken, when sin is in the picture, when death is running rampant, there has to be another to cover the sin of the other. There is no way. We can't just say, God, sweep it under the rug. Be passive aggressive about it. Just deal with it. Can't you just forget about it? God doesn't work like that. And that's, that's difficult, especially in our culture and our time today, when we like to blow it off and be inconsistent, and it's all good, and we're all happy and whatever. No. God has a standard. And that standard is perfect throughout time. There has to be another death. Now, in the original Testament, the times of Genesis, times of Leviticus, all the, the prophets, the kings, all that, um, it was always incomplete. The atonement at the altar, at, you know, with that sacrifice that God made a way for, so the, the sins of the people could be covered for a time, the people in that time didn't have the privilege of we, what we now have. So the writer 
to the Hebrews, we, just, we saw that passage, we heard that passage read just a few minutes ago, has, has the honor and really the joy of looking back and seeing how Jesus fulfills that law. That it's no longer atonement covering up for a time. That I have to go and do these sacrifices and be involved in the sacrificial system so that God will be okay with me for a while. Jesus comes to perfectly end that series of sacrifice after sacrifice in the temple and the blood. And only he can do it because he's the perfect God and perfect man together. He is the one uniquely, uh, uh, who has uniquely come to provide the way so that that sacrificial system can end through his one sacrifice of his body on the cross. The writer of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's been the standard for centuries, millennia to that point. It's always been that way, whether you like it or not, whether you completely understand it. It's, sin is that serious, and lifeblood is that essential, and that's the standard God has. So without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. He, the writer says, being Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Brothers and sisters, those of you who are attending this morning, the reason that we worship is that we know that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again. And even as Paul says in the, in the, in the New Testament, Paul said that our, our worship is in vain unless we know that, unless we see clearly with the eyes of faith that we understand that Jesus is the answer to our deepest need and longing, and it all becomes fulfilled in what he's done once and for all. No longer any need for any sacrificial system and the temple and all that those rites showed us. It's all been perfected in the one man and the one sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I've got to do it. This is the only way. Why? So that you and I can be redeemed that we can be saved, that we can have new life because of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying that plainly for the disciples to hear for the first time. And do they get it? Absolutely not. That's not what the Messiah, the anointed one, are you kidding? You, you, if you're the anointed one, you come as the king. You come as a deliverer from the, the, the oppressors. He did, but just not in a way that anyone had ever thought of before. So on this side of it, if you heard that story before, it kind of becomes ho-hum. But to the disciples, I mean, no one had ever taught this stuff. A suffering king, Messiah? Are you kidding me? Those two things don't co go, they don't go together. They cannot coexist. No one had ever thought of that. And Jesus says, that's me. I am king. I am bringing a new kingdom. And for that to become fully realized, I've got to suffer. I must do this. <laughs> Mind-blowing experience for all of those disciples to hear. And even today, even though centuries removed, it's still mind-blowing. Why? I know I can speak directly from my own experience. That Jesus would want to be my king. I know me. I know what I've done. I know what I've thought. I know my experiences, and yet he sees me, and he says again, the Son of Man must suffer and die at the hands of these people and rise again. Why? So that my salvation can be complete. If you've lost track of that, then you're in a very dangerous place. If you're hearing that for the first time, don't go to that dangerous place. Realize that Jesus must and had to suffer so that you could be saved. It is that simple, it is that plain, and it is also that glorious. So, let's move on. Uh, boy, I'm way off my track here. <laughs> That's all right. Let's move on here. Following. Okay, what does that mean? It's not enough for someone to declare who Jesus is and walk away. All right, so let's... 
Let's go back to the, the passage here. Uh, calling the crowd and calling the crowd to him with his, with his disciples, he said. This is significant, what Mark is cluing us in on. It's not just Peter. Uh, it's not just the disciples. He's calling the crowd. We're part of the crowd. We are hearing this for the first time, so to speak. We need to listen up. This is for everybody. So he calls everyone. And he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. He must suffer many things. And, and let me, let me uh, add this real quick. It's not just any kind of suffering. It's not, uh, it's not, there's nothing random involved in here. You can't just be walking down the street and some uh, random violent flash mob take him out. It's got to be suffering at the hands, and he says it, of the elders, the chief priests, uh, and, and the scribes. Why is that? Now think about that. Talked about a sacrificial system. Talking about a little bit about atonement, the covering up of sin. All that has to do with, uh, with satisfying that legal situation, okay? Uh, to be justified is another word that the New Testament describes for us and, and, and fleshes out for us in our relationship with Jesus because of his suffering. To be right, in other words, to be right before God requires uh, the legal stamp of approval, okay? Jesus had to suffer and die, not just in the hands of any random mob, but who? The legal authority. Now, as we will look in the Passion Week, we'll see how messed up the legal authority was in the way that they went about uh, 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 finding him guilty, all right? But even so, he had to be condemned by the authority. There is something in that legal necessity that also reminds us that he fulfilled the law. Okay, are you with me on that? Jesus had, as he suffered, he had to fulfill the law. Even though it was messed up in that situation, he still had to do it. Otherwise, it would not have been fully part of God's plan. So he fulfilled the law. And he, Peter, uh, as Peter interacts with him and Jesus says, get behind me, Jesus had to suffer. He had to suffer many things, not just the, the, the cross. Now think about it in this way. His suffering begins right then. Peter, Peter, rebu Peter, his disciple, rebukes him. Peter still doesn't get it. He's just said, Lord, you're the Messiah. He said that because he understands a certain thing about definition of Messiah, a certain role to be filled, uh, and not about the suffering. So Jesus is tr or Peter's trying to talk Jesus out of it. The suffering begins with his friend. He's poured one or two or whatever years of his life into Peter, and Peter just called him Lord, but it doesn't really mean Lord because he's trying to rebuke or change his mind. He's aggressively trying to change his mind. Imagine at that moment the rejection in his heart that he feels. It's not all about the whips and the blood. It's about the rejection that, that Jesus has to endure from the, the ones closest to him. Do you see that? The suffering is right then and right there. So no wonder Jesus turns and looks at Peter, looks at the whole group, get behind me, Satan. You can't say I'm Lord and still reject my lordship. You can't. You can't just say you're a nice guy, you're a nice preacher, now do what I want you to do. And don't, you know, don't cross me, Lord. Don't do that. Do what I want you to do, and then everything's okay. That is exactly what Satan did when, when Satan tempted him. It wasn't just those three temptations. It certainly was ongoing temptation constantly. If you just tweak it, if you just change a little bit, if you just bow a knee here, no one gets hurt, right? Just change these stones to bread. 
Just do a little bit. That's okay. It's just a little compromise, and no one has to know about it. Just change the mission a little bit so that it aligns with what I want. Peter says, and many times we say, Jesus says, no way. If you do that, then what you're doing is the same thing as Satan tried to do. It's about my thing, whatever that is, not yours. So at that point, Jesus would cease to be Lord, Messiah, anointed one in his life. I hope you understand that. There's no middle ground. In this passage, he makes it plain and clear. If you come and say, Jesus, you're it, you're the Messiah, then he also, as Messiah, has a authority over your life. You claim him to be Lord, what does Lord mean? Now, we don't use that in our language, our vernacular, anything. You know, we don't get that. You claim someone as Lord, you're my Lord, are you, you know, you don't just walk away and do your own thing anymore. You can't. If you're standing before your Lord, your authority, the one that you serve, the one that you love, then they have authority over your life. And that's what it means as we start talking about this next portion. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. At that point, Jesus is also making clear not only his own role as Messiah, but as you see me suffer, guess what? I have authority over your life now. If you claim to follow me, you're going to actually follow me. That will take you where you've never thought you'd ever go, and you certainly don't want to go. And thankfully, that's not that all important anymore. Uh, because obedience is. And even if you don't want to do it, things are changing in this new kingdom that you are now saying, I'm in charge of. That is the new reality that followers have to begin to consider. He's Messiah, and he's Lord, and I'm not. Now, that's huge. It's huge for Peter, the disciples, even now as we consider, even now as I say it, I'm not Lord. I'm not in control. So much of what Jesus begins to teach on right here is so huge for us personally, even in our culture today, even especially for the church today, where we try to make everything so comfortable and so easy and so welcoming and so huggy, I don't know what else words to say, uh, to make Christianity such an easy thing, an endeavor that's so pleasant, right? It's got to be pleasant in our culture or else, ah, who cares about that? Um, an author, Neil Postman, he's been dead for a few now, years now. He died, of, I think, of lung cancer. Uh, he was a humanist. He was not a, a Christian, not a believer, follower of Christ. But he, he wrote so, in such an articulate way he was a cultural critic. Um, he wrote a book called, uh, oh, nuts. I've got to get the title right here. Amusing Ourselves to Death. I think it's on the slide here. Yes, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Wrote it in 1985, cultural critic in 85 of, of technological advances and how we're so enthralled with our technology in 85. What was the technology in 85? Anybody remember I mean, a brick phone, right? Was that 85? What else was 85? I, was Nintendo around in 85? Atari, right? You know, squares on the screen. Um, certainly not uh, internet. I mean, I can't even remember. A Walkman? Yeah. If, what would... What would Neil Postman write about today <laughs> if he were around today as a critic of our cultural and, and how enthralled we are with our technology and our stuff? So he's an outsider to faith, and he says this, I believe I am not mistaken in saying that Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. When it is delivered as easy and amusing, it is another kind of religion altogether. 
mic drop moment. That's his outside perspective looking in, and he is critiquing uh, how technology is in advancing and even influencing religion. You know, organized, official, traditional, institutional, religious expression, and the path that it's going on. And that was 85. Now think about that. I, you know, we use technology at least somewhat, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you know, that, that's helpful to the group. What if we didn't have technology? Ah! You know, would anybody come to church? Really? Is it that big of a deal? Do we get so enthralled with stuff and tech and whatever that we lose sight of why we're the church in the first place? What about your personal life? You know, have you ever, could, I'm sure post, no one could have guessed in 85 that everyone would be walking around like this. People, have you seen videos, people walking off streets into holes because they're looking at their phones? Have you seen this stuff? It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's out there. People walking into cars and, you know, like, I don't know, off cliffs. I don't know. But it's crazy stuff. We're so busy looking at our screen. It's ridiculous. The advances that begin to take over our lives, and we're not even thinking about it. What takes over in a Christian's life that has nothing to do with following Christ? that we can justify what's well, not that bad or I, I need this for some related thing you see where I'm going with that plainly following Jesus and not giving him up in any way to supposedly gain the whole world that he talks about but following him Jesus clarifies the ultimate the ultimate paradox at the end of verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Now he, he, he mentions, I think this is important, losing life for Jesus and the gospel. Not, I mean, they're two parallel ideas, but they're different things as well. They're distinct. The clarification is necessary. They have to go together, but especially for anyone who would say, you know, I'm going to give my all for Jesus, and that's it. Because especially today, still, the preference is on a personal salvation. I just, you know, my faith, what I do is in my own little bubble, and that's as far as I'm going to go with it. I can't remember which politician made that real popular. Um, it's not coming. Back in 1980 or whatever it was. What's her face? First one to run for vice president. I still remember that, sort of. Yeah, like, how did she say it? Per, my, it's a personal religious belief, or something like that. It, it was big at the time to hear a politician say that, and it probably was negative for her at the time, but now that's everywhere. I will follow you, Jesus, and that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll put, a dog ear that one, right? That's as far as I'm going to, no, no one says that, but that's kind of the understanding. I'll go as far as believing in you for my personal benefit, because it's really about my personal relationship with you, Jesus. And Jesus does not, he never gives it an option, but he even specifies it here. For Jesus and the gospel. Believer, if you give your life to Jesus, if you respond to him in faith and say, I'm going to believe you, trust in you for salvation, then you also join in as a part and a player and a functional piece of Jesus' gospel mission. They go together. You can't have one without the other. Only then are you really, truly following Jesus. That's what he's going at. And what does he say here? For the gospel means, verse 36 and 37, it's important. So let me read it again. Follow along. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So he's, speci he's clarifying even more what does the gospel mean and some ways that we could possibly get off track, okay? Gaining the whole world will result in forfeiting your soul. Uh, it could be material things, could be lots of, you know, certainly not limited to material things. See prosperity gospel. Gaining stuff does not equate with Jesus. You will have to lose and lose out big. 
There is no way prosperity gospel can, can uh, uh, live or, or be associated with Jesus' gospel and what he teaches. So no amount of gaining makes you better before Jesus. But what does he also say? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So no amount of gaining and no amount of giving. You cannot earn your way. You cannot give yourself into a right relationship with Jesus. There is no way you can pile it up, your, your, uh, uh, your, your good efforts and, and trying to love people and being a good person. That kind of giving never results in what Jesus wants for, from his followers. So another thing, and here, you know, get, this gets a little more subtle when it comes to this idea of giving. What if, as a Christian, I want to uh, give in a self-disciplined way? Okay? I want to, I really want to do, when I read these verses, okay, denying myself, taking up my cross, and following him, so if I equate that with just being more self-disciplined, if I can reduce it to that, then I can be more disciplined today with my life and what I do and what I say, and equate that with giving up. And No, Jesus is not saying that either. What it amounts to isn't self-discipline, but self-denial. When Jesus says, let him deny himself and take up his cross, he is not uh, uh, laying out for us a way to be a, a better moral person. That kind of giving doesn't measure up either. Are you following me? Now, I ran across this quote uh, Ernest Best, he wrote a book called Following Jesus, kind of a, a running commentary in the book of Mark. And he says this. I just love the way he says it. It is not the denial of something to the self, but the denial of the self itself. That's what I'm trying to get at, this idea of self-discipline. If I could just deny enough good things, or things that I think are good, you know, just, you know, with the diet plan. And I, I'm just not going to eat the ice cream and the cupcakes, and I'm somehow going to get there, Right? Uh, as a Christian, I just deny myself this stuff, this bad stuff over here, and don't do that over there, then certainly that's what Jesus is talking about. That doesn't even scratch the surface of what Jesus is really talking about when he says deny yourself, but the denial of the self itself. Now ponder what he says. I think he says it really well. It is the opposite of self-affirmation, of putting value on one's being, one's life, one's position before man or God, of claiming rights and privilege peculiar to one's special position in life, or even of those normally believed to belong to the human being as such. Do you see the extent that he's going as he describes that? That's where it gets uncomfortable. Because you know what? At some point, we're all uh, given to this idea, yes, but I need to have certain things, right? Right? I mean, Jesus wouldn't take that away, right? I mean, Jesus wouldn't take my loved ones away, right? He wouldn't take uh, my house, my job away, right? He wouldn't ask for a denial of, of those things that are just basic needs in life, right? And especially in our culture, we think about all the more. There are some things we hold to really tight. Jesus, you better not touch that. That's the attitude. And Jesus is saying, yep, that's mine too. You don't have the right to hold anything back. When Jesus says, deny yourself and take up the cross, you're saying it's all yours. Nothing held back. Nothing left that's still in your heart and in your hand saying, this is mine. It's all gone. Every bit, every ounce. Nothing less. And that's where it gets uncomfortable. I hope you're uncomfortable. Because I can't imagine the uncomfortable level of the disciples before Jesus as they're hearing this. What? They knew, they've seen criminals dying, struggling, the humiliation and the pain, all the ancient Writers, historians agree there was no worse way to die 
in any way that you can measure it. Did not happen. That was the worst. Romans perfected it. And Jesus says, be ready to do that. Take it up and follow him. Nothing left. It's all his. Even every ounce of blood. That is the dramatic moment in the silence of that moment, I believe, where they're looking at him, that? And even in somewhere in us, at time to, I mean, from time to time, don't you, you know, even if you follow Jesus for a long time, that too? If I, cut, I thought I've got past that, right? And then that, you bring that into my life, that too? Really? You expect me to follow you through that? Everything he claims. When he says he's Lord, he's Lord. And there is nothing left out. Man, this is tough. So I was reading this this past week. Uh, there are times as I, man, as you stop and I think about the passage, ah, I, I just hit a wall. It's hard still at times to think about the authority of Jesus in my life and whether or not I willingly to say nothing of joyfully, and willing to follow and obey. So, the ultimate sacrifice of Christ calls for the ultimate sacrifice of self. Every time. Sacrificing, following, and I threw out that word, glorifying. What does Jesus say? Chapter 9, verse 1. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So some interpreters get all confused. Oh wait, they must be talking about Jesus' second coming and they're all dead now, right? So that's ridiculous. Of course he's not saying that. Uh, he's talking about a different coming in power with his resurrection and the power of God uh, evident, plain, many witnesses that Jesus is now walking around and we saw him dead and he was not breathing and he bled out on the ground and now he's alive and it's his body. We can touch it. We can hear his voice. We see him eating stuff. This doesn't happen every day. That's a powerful thing. The people, the disciples, so many, they saw the kingdom of God in a whole new reality because Jesus lives. What power is he talking about? It's not just, in a, in a limited understanding, the power of the resurrection then for them to see, but because that living power, that resurrection power, changes us completely and fully and the way that we consider suffering and following. So we can't just skip over that, and then the rest of chapter 9 gets us deeper into this understanding of glorifying Jesus for who he really is, for the fact that he's God. But Jesus, hear this, Jesus gives this challenge to follow, to take up your cross, to forfeit all the whole world and gain your soul in him. Jesus doesn't do that just to frustrate us or to leave us, oh, you're right, there's no way. I might as well go be a pagan, go to the temple and what, you know, engage in whatever. He's not doing that. All of that is necessary as a follower of Jesus in his kingdom and he gives the power for it to actually happen. It's not pie in the sky. It's not just empty, feel-good religious talk. It is based and grounded in the power of a living God, uh, made evident and clearly evident in a living, risen Lord. So that idea of suffering and, and suffering while you follow is difficult. <laughs> it's, that's a tough one to grasp. Yep. The full extent of what Jesus says is necessary, uh, that's, that's hard. But take heart and note the fact that those things come into focus. Just like that blind guy who, who saw sort of, then he saw fully. That's where we're at. We're, we see as we first come to Christ in faith, we see foggy. Yeah, it's out there. But as we follow him, he brings these concepts and so many others in life with him and his kingdom. He brings them into razor sharp focus. You got to stick with him as his promises prove themselves 
in our lives. Uh, Christ, a risen Christ, is sufficient to empower his followers to follow in the manner that Jesus describes. He doesn't leave us hanging. He never does. He is good enough to supply all that's needed. Keep going back to this guy. I just can't resist it. I've read about him. I've read his writings. This is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he lived in the 1930s in Nazi Germany, came to America, could have stayed in America, goes back to Germany before the beginning of World War II because he wanted to be a part of what the church was going through. Uh, wrote so much, experienced so much as far as following Christ in his 30s. He's a complicated guy. He was part of the plot to kill Hitler. Uh, so, you know, how does a Christian fit in that? And we're not going to get into that. Uh, he did what he felt was necessary at the time. And because of the fact that he was involved in that plot, he was arrested, thrown into prison, uh, and eventually executed by the specific command of Hitler shortly before Hitler was dead. So, Dietrich is in, in prison, and uh, up until a few months before he was executed, still had writing privileges. He wrote to his family, to his wife, uh, to other believers that are part of what they called the Confessing Church at the time, because the Lutheran Church had bought into the Nazi scheme. So they started the Confessing Church. Uh, he is an example of a guy who was understanding along the way what, how suffering and following and how Jesus provides the right stuff <laughs> to be able to do that when you set your eyes on Jesus and you begin to understand what his plan is. And you know what? That comes, it's, it, I know in my life, that comes into sharp focus when we suffer more. When you have less to go on, less to fall back on, less energy, less life, or when you're super challenged, then, then you're all the more rapidly you're drawn into a place and a position before Christ that you begin to realize. So here's what Bonhoeffer wrote a few months uh, to a friend in a letter before he died. How should one become arrogant over successes or shaken by one's failures when one shares in God's suffering in the life of this world? How does any of that compare, he says. I am grateful that I have been allowed this insight, and I know that it is only on the path that I have finally taken that I was able to learn this. I didn't get it, really, until I truly followed Christ. And, wow, the situation he went through, the life that he lived, he could have, he could have walked out. He had every option to do that. He didn't. Does that make him such a great person? Do we worship him? No. Along the path, that's what he learned. May God lead us kindly through these times, but above all, may God lead us to himself. Just what Jesus says in chapter 9. There are some that are standing here, they'll not taste death, they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. Not just seeing it with their eyes, they know it in their heart and in their lives. That power transforms everything. And they understand who Jesus really is. And what he gives is so much better than any tempting sellout. Any compromise. Any way that you could avoid suffering somehow. Any way that you could justify keeping and holding on to a little bit. Uh -uh. As you give up, then you truly realize all that you've gained in Christ. Are you following with that? This is just one example of many men and women who experienced and learned that along the way. Now, in April 1945, Hitler gives the order a month before Nazi Germany falls. Bonhoeffer and all these other conspirators, they're going to die uh, uh, by hanging. They're gonna, you're going to hang. And one of the last orders he gives, as Bonhoeffer is walking uh, towards the scaffolding with the noose hanging in his vision. The chaplain that was with him recorded, for all we know, are his final words. And this is what he said. With the noose in sight, he said, this is the end. For me, the beginning of life. He saw right through that noose to Jesus. I'm sure he did. The beginning of real life. 
unhindered by the past and by sin and by the emptiness and by this world. All he wanted as he progressed on that journey was more and more of Jesus. And at the very end, he sees, I get Jesus. I can't, I get choked up thinking about it. I can't imagine I would ever do that or say that or think that. And maybe he didn't think that either unless he got on the path, unless he followed, unless he obeyed, unless he served Christ. And then the more that he tasted, the more he received the power needed, the more you could move forward. And then to see Jesus, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. Isn't that awesome? That's, brothers and sisters, that's where we've got to be moving. So do I have a life? Do I have a life? Am I beginning to move? Am I getting to see that path that I could say that and mean it? Not say something good religious sounding stuff, but to say, yep, the end, it's just the end to anybody else. But that's truly the beginning. Choose a path that has Jesus not only as your spiritual guide for better living, but choose a path that has Jesus and his glory as the goal to it all. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you again, and we humble our hearts in worship, and we look to you, Jesus, I pray, with eyes of faith that are seeing more and more clearly. Lord Jesus, bring us to that point where we can begin to see that you are everything that I can give up the world, that stuff doesn't matter, to know and to have you. And in that process of losing that stuff, to gain my soul, because I can see you in that journey, in that path. Lord, open our eyes to the glory of yourself and fill us, Lord, with an ever-increasing longing to see you glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen.